Hopefully everybody's got a chance to, to dial in. So uh, good afternoon and welcome to uh, today's Revolution Asset Management webinar. My name is Phelan O'Neill, Distribution Director at Channel Capital. Uh, so welcome to the second webinar of, of the year and our last webinar back in March. Uh, we started to talk about the prospect of, uh, of rising rates from central banks. Uh, so within a very, sp very short space of time, uh, we have shifted gears to an aggressive hiking cycle uh, through most Western central banks, the RBA included. So uh, that's throwing up some risks, but also some, some opportunities, uh, which the team will, will go through uh, today. So on, on the webinar today, uh, as usual, we're joined by uh, Revolution CIO Bob Sahoda uh, and also Senior Portfolio Manager Simon Petrus. Uh, so the agenda today uh, will cover a few different areas, uh, the impact of rising rates on the fund, uh, so the practical impact of what's what's actually happening in the portfolio. Um, there's been a, a noticeable change in market dynamics since our, our last update, and it's very quickly become uh, a lender's market, uh, which, which Bob will talk to. And uh, we'll give you a few examples that Simon has of exactly the kind of, kind of opportunities that's, that's throwing up for the team. Uh, and uh, we'll also look at a, a practical example of the benefit of, of private debt in uh, sophisticated portfolios, uh, some of the benefits that can be achieved for, for portfolio constructors. Uh, so in this webinar, as we usually do, we, we focus on the uh, private debt fund number two, uh, also referred to in, in this presentation as the master fund. So for anybody that's investing through the wholesale feeder vehicle, um, just note that the portfolio characteristics and returns will, will vary slightly uh, and the figures shown um, can be updated by the channel team for the for the wholesale fund. So uh, on the screen, you will have seen a, a disclaimer uh, come up. So please familiarize yourself with this uh, and send through questions uh, as we go through the webinar. We'd like to get as many questions as possible and we'll spend time going through as many as we can get to. And if we if we miss them, we'll, we'll try and get to you after the webinar. Uh, so Bob, uh, I'll hand it over to you to, to kick off with the business update. Uh, great, Phelan. Uh, thank you um, for the, the warm introduction and uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Revolution Asset Management webinar. Uh, it's been, uh, it seems like an eternity since our last webinar in terms of uh, the state of play of the market. So, you know, we're gonna be going through what that means in terms of implications for private debt, uh, how they incorporate into portfolios, what are the opportunities, as Fala mentioned, that we're seeing in this market? Because uh, we are familiar with, with various market cycles and, and at various points in time, there are throwing up different sets of opportunities. But um, before we get there, um, uh, uh, the, you can see uh, we've got now uh, $2 billion, uh, in excess of $2 billion, $2 billion of committed capital. Um, Revolution Private Debt Fund number one is now officially uh, in its um, harvesting period. Uh, it it went, went through its reinvestment period at June 30. So the uh, assets of that, or the, the, the loans in that portfolio, as they mature, will be returning principal back to uh, the investors of that fund. Current yield of maturity is 7.3 across 23 loans. Um, the main flagship fund is the open-ended vehicle, which is the Revolution Private Debt Fund number two. Um, it's now in excess of $1.4 billion of um, committed capital. We'll show you the glide path of how the yield to maturity, which is currently 7.6%, and how that yield to maturity has changed in line with um, the RBA moves and, and interest rates rising, translating to BBSW, um, and, and that immediate sort of uh, impact on, on performance. Uh, we have 43 loans and an average of double B plus average credit rating, which sits just shy of uh, investment grade. We're very fortunate to have the support of um, you know, both large institutional clients, uh, as well as high net worths, family offices, uh, high, and, and charities and, and other foundations. We have, we're very fortunate also to have uh, two institutional um, recommendations from consultants, as well as um, one major research house where um, we'll talk about uh, the upgrade there. We're also, um, still finding a healthy uh, portfolio of pipeline opportunities, of which we're still maintaining a very, very um, disciplined approach in having uh, our deal approval rate sitting around about 25%. And uh, as always, we're very thankful for having the support of Channel Capital, who really um, assist us in, in every, everything outside of 
uh, the investment activities in back of middle office, risk and compliance, finance, IT, uh, Phalum's part of the distribution effort. So we should always uh, you know, think about the, the broader team that, that helped to deliver you know, the performance and the strategy to, to our investors. Um, this is our, our major milestones. The two things I'll call out are the more recent ones. Uh, we, were, we were very pleased to have a, an upgrade from Zenith. And I know a number of you um, rely on external research ratings. So we've now been um, increased uh, and upgraded to recommended um, from Zenith as of May this year. And as I mentioned, um, in June, we crossed over uh, $2 billion of committed capital for the strategy with um, the inclusion of a larger institutional client, which uh, we should be able to name and, um, and, and provide some details in the um, not too distant future. So next slide. Uh, this is a slide that hopefully is quite familiar to uh, many of you who are, uh, are currently in the fund or have clients that utilize the fund. It is um, our strategy in the context of the broader universe of private debt strategies. Uh, and they vary from um, low risk, low return, like investment grade corporates and infrastructure debt to ones where there are much higher risk return, like special sits, uh, special situations, distressed debt, and even property development and construction, uh, which I might, you know, I'll make a couple of comments on uh, as we go through. Um, you know, we also don't do smaller company lending like bilateral SME lending and, and don't do any mezzanine. We are very, very much focused on three asset classes within the private debt universe. Commercial real estate lending for us is really defined by what we don't do. We don't invest in property construction deals. So almost every day when you open the AFR or you look through um, the other news channels, there is more and more stress in the construction industry, uh, be it insolvency of builders and developers, uh, the pressures on supply, the pressure on interest rates, all, all hitting about the same time. We are very fortunate that we've uh, avoided that sector from the inception of the firm. It is very much a cyclical industry, which we avoid. As a result, we've done very few commercial real estate deals uh, because we look for good, stable tenant cash flow in commercial office, retail shopping centers, and industrial property. But banks are currently awash with a lot of liquidity, so there hasn't been a lot for us to do. But we remain patient, and if that opportunity opens up, we'll be very much in a position where we can take advantage of that. Uh, the other two areas have been much more active for us. The last couple of years have been very active in the private company and leveraged buyout lending um, sphere. This is where private equity um, go out and buy household names uh, like Arnott's Biscuits, MYOB, um, you know, very familiar names. Healthscape Hospitals is another one where we provide alongside a large consortium of other lenders the senior secure debt to that particular um, type of acquisition. Uh, we again are very disciplined in that space, picking only non-cyclical industries through the cycle like consumer staples, healthcare, mission critical software, um, to name a few. And then the third area is asset-backed securities. So these are, we, we don't go out and issue mortgages or auto loans or credit cards or personal loans ourselves, but we do assist in really supporting the market for non-bank lenders who are engaged in those loans. Uh, we don't invest uh, and, and lend money to those particular companies. Instead, we prefer to lend money to the private uh, revolving lines that, that they currently fund themselves with, with the pool of receivable loans forming our security uh, when we make those, those particular loans. So across these three different subsectors, we're looking to generate a portfolio return of four to five percent above the prevailing cash rate. Uh, and today that, that translates into a yield to maturity in the portfolio of 7.6%. And the next slide we'll, we'll sort of go through how that's changed over the, the last little while. Uh, a quick reminder of um, you know, what we don't do as well, you know, alongside not doing any property construction and SME, we also have a very strong bent on ESG. Uh, it's part of our ingrained investment um, process. Uh, and we've now been through a number of um, pictures where we've, we've talked to both large and smaller clients where we've gone through all of our credentials and looking through ESG. And we're very proud of the fact that we occupy um, a leadership role in the private debt markets when it comes to, you know, more contemporary thoughts on sustainable lending uh, in the space. And if anybody's got any um, questions that flow from that, very happy to, um, to provide you with more information 
you know, post this webinar. Next slide. So I mentioned, um, you know, it's been an interesting period of time with, um, with um, central banks all raising rates. And, and as Phelan said, RBA has, um, has also been part of that, that, um, that, that thematic in, uh, in trying to quash inflation at a time where it looks like it's, uh, it's, it's getting out of control. We uh, would remind everybody that uh, we invest in only floating rate assets. So 100% of our portfolio is all in floating rate assets. The floating rate assets are really then determined by the swap rates, which in turn is then affected by the, the baseline RBA cash rate. So you can see there at the, at the bottom of that chart, we had a long period where rates were very close to zero. And in May of this year, we started to see the RBA and, and Governor Lowe starting to hike rates uh, at an increasing rate. Um, and so we now sit with a cash rate of 1.35% which um, is looking like it's going to go much higher. If you look at where the current bond, bond market's pricing, you know, it's in excess of 3% by the end of the year. We, we may not necessarily get there, but you can see there that the, how it tr directly translates into the portfolio yield to maturity for fund number two in this case. So you can see there in the light blue line with the, uh, the diamonds, we've got a very stable credit margin but the credit margin is then applied above a, the prevailing BBSW or floating rate. So as these loans come up for their next interest period, they're struck off the most recent um, interest rates. So you can then see on a monthly and quarterly basis as these loans are resetting, you can see that, that yield of the portfolio growing from around about 6% to 7.6% um, currently. And that, you know, depending on what, what rates do going forward, we will keep pace with any, any increases in interest rates. I mean, for most of the market is factoring in at least a 50 basis point rise in the August meeting. And um, the last thing I would say is whilst rates have gone up, it hasn't translated into bank term deposits. Uh, why is that? It's because banks have actually got quite a lot of liquidity already on their balance sheets uh, and, and really have not um, chose, chose to increase those, those term deposit rates. So, so it's a bit different in terms of that dislocation when you think about, you know, the direct transmission mechanism that we have in the performance of our portfolios versus banks holding that back um, for depositors and then TD guys. Um, the next slide. This, this is a really interesting slide that I, I wanted to highlight how the market's changed over the last six to eight weeks. Um, what has changed? We had a long period where there was a lot of liquidity in the market because there was very easy monetary policy, we had quantitative easing across the world. It was pretty easy to, to uh, raise, raise debt funding. Um, but really, we've seen that change quite dramatically over the last six to eight weeks. Uh, and we would say now it's much more of a lender's market in leverage buyout lending than it has been for many years. Um, and the way we illustrate that is really two ways. Firstly, the pricing of deals. And then secondly, the, the terms and conditions that are attached to these deals. So in, um, in these two examples that we've, we've called out here, uh, we've picked two um, great industries that we have you know, quite, a, quite a strong representation in, uh, in the fund already. So that is um, software, so mission critical software, where you've got this, this particular uh, company provides software uh, to the legal profession where it is ingrained in all of its customers' day-to-day uh, -day business operations. Very difficult for it to be displaced. Very high retention rates of clients uh, across many, many years of trading. When this deal was first announced, you can see there the credit margin uh, was 475 or 4.75% above the prevailing floating rate. By the time the deal was done, some six to eight weeks later, the pricing is now 5.5% uh, or 550 basis points. So that's just a, a widening of the credit margin in line with what's prevailing in the markets. Um, the second deal uh, was initially marketed at 425 or 4.25% and ended up being priced at 5.25%, so a full 1% higher. Um, I'll quickly explain step down credit margins. In a lot of LBO deals, leverage buyout deals, when a company um, uh, basically has a growth in its EBITDA or cuts its expenses, which causes the leverage to fall, i.e. becomes more conservative in terms of the amount of debt on the balance sheet, 
they get rewarded by having lower credit margins stepping down upon you know that, that leverage falling, which is measured by debt to EBITDA. So this particular deal in, in, in um, the deal number one had two step down margins. So every time you had a half a, a, a half a turn or or debt to EBITDA fall by 0.5, you had the credit margin step down by 25 basis points two times. Uh, in the final outcome, we were able to negotiate because of our size, um, now being able to do up to $100 million per deal is to negotiate that out of the deal completely. So that margin of 550 will be prevailing over the course of the, the, the particular period of the loan and not step down in terms of its margin, even if, as we expect, the company delivers. Uh, in the second example, we had three different rungs in these step down margins and we're able to negotiate that to only having a singular step down margin by 25 basis points from 525 down to 500 or 5% and that being the, uh, the prevailing rate for the rest of the loan. You can see there also the upfront fees. So these are upfront fees we receive on behalf of our investments and the loans that we make initially marketed both deals with 1% upfront. In the final outcome, this was doubled to 2%. And that again is a, a case where the market has changed in terms of the pendulum, swinging back into favor of, of, of lenders rather than the borrowers. So you can see there the margins have increased uh, commensurately and the all in yield, which has been assisted by both that base rate uh, being higher, uh, which we, we covered on the previous slide, plus these margins and upfronts uh, moving up as well, we've got you know, a case where in deal number one, 7.3% has, has ultimately changed to being 8.4. And the second example, 6.8 to 8.1. So materially higher yield in terms of the same deals. Now let's have a look at the terms. So in deal number one, there was a case where there was second lien, i.e. subordinated debt uh, that was included initially in the marketing of that deal that was ultimately done away with. So the first lien leverage or the senior secured debt that we provide um, has, has moved back back from five, um, five and a half time, times to uh, debt to EBITDA to five times. And then the total leverage is actually, because we've done away with the second lien, is, is all in five times. And we've been able to negotiate in, in terms of qualitative ways, much more stringent protections so there's less flexibility of management um, to, um, to have more flexibility under that loan because of the ability for us to negotiate that um, much more strongly. Uh, and the same way we were able to negotiate that in the, in the second deal, in the healthcare deal, with much more qualitative lender protections, uh, being able to control asset disposals, uh, what happens to um, EBITDA and pro formas, um, and then you know, additional debt um, and, and making a, a, a much smaller case for that. And, and the first lien leverage on that deal is, is sub 5% of 4.75. So you can see that the pricing has actually moved to be more attractive. And then the terms have actually become much more attractive as well at the same time in response to the current market conditions. Uh, and this is really part of the, the opportunistic way where we've got patient capital to take advantage of some of these um, excellent opportunities in the market. So I might um, hand over to my colleague, um, Dr. Simon Petrus, we're going to in introduce a little bit of, um, of, of academia into, uh, into the webinar by talking about private debt into uh, asset allocations and how people should be thinking about that. Sure. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, so we might yeah, zoom out and, and talk a bit about asset allocation, as Bob mentioned, and in particular, the increasing role of, of private debt and alternatives generally in asset allocation. And one of the, the key reasons for this growth um, is really the, the rise of the, the Yale model and its mercurial CEO, David Swenson, who is um, perhaps not familiar to, to everyone, but he's generally considered um, the goat of asset allocation. He's the sort of the Tiger Woods or the Michael Jordan of asset allocation. And, and why is he considered in such high regard? Well, for his 36 years in charge as CEO, CIO of, of the Yale Endowment uh, from 85 2021, he produced uh, compound annual returns of 13.7% per annum, which is, is pretty impressive, but it's particularly impressive when you compare it to, to his peers. Um, he was able to outperform the average endowment by 3.4% and then outperform a traditional 60-40 uh, uh, stock and, and, and bond portfolio 
uh, by 4%, which is a significant level of outperformance over such a, such a long period of time. And effectively, um, you know, David Swenson and his, uh, his employees, his acolytes, have sort of spread, and, and a lot of the people that have worked for him now manage most of the major endowments in the US. So essentially, um, you know, what is, the, what is the Yale model? If we can sort of break it down uh, into simpler terms, he's, he's written a whole book on, on the topic, but you know, essentially summing it down in, into a couple of points, um, what, what David Swenson realized and, and what he was able to exploit is the fact that um, Yale Endowment had a very long-term uh, investment horizon. So they didn't need to have all of their money in liquid, uh, liquid stock, you know, daily liquid stock and, and fixed, uh, fixed interest bond funds. So he was able to, um, to really you know, re significantly reduce those allocations relative to his peers. And he really um, upped the allocation to alternatives you know, such as you know, private debt, private equity, venture capital, uh, real estate, infrastructure, et cetera. And so by doing that, he was able to um, basically increase the diversification in his portfolio uh, capture the illiquidity premium, particularly in the, in the private markets investments, uh, exploit lower volatility, and then what this uh, helped to do was reduce drawdowns, which ultimately this combination of all these factors really helped to drive up his long-term compound returns. And you can see these factors are all, uh, all, are all very, uh, very present in, in private debt. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, thanks, Matt. Um, so if we, if we think about the Yale portfolio and the Yale model a bit closer to home, it's quite topical because, you know, being July, we, we received the, the latest update from, from super funds for the, for the financial year. And it was, it was very interesting to, to note that um, Host Plus uh, was able to be not only the top performer on a, on a one-year basis, but more significantly over a 10-year basis. And, it's very clear from sort of interviews and, and quotes in the press that Host Plus has embraced many elements of the, of the Yale model. Um, in 2015, for example, they, they state that they, you know, significantly reduced their exposure to, to, list, um, to bonds in the belief that bond portfolios would not provide downside protection to market volatility during the low interest rate period. And this is particularly relevant uh, for the last financial year where you had both, um, both listed equities and bond markets having significantly negative, uh, negative returns. And, and this has really helped to sort of you know, entrench their top spot on both the one year and 10 year rating. If you look at the other sort of super funds uh, in, in the top 10, this sort of by 10 year returns, um, you know, I think all of, all of these super funds have to some, um, to some extent uh, been able to embrace the Yale model and, and the, the characteristics of it. And I think, you know, Host Plus is well known to have, you know, quite a young, uh, young member base. Um, so they're not expecting significant outflow. So much like, you know, an endowment, they've been able to take a, a much, you know, longer term view on asset allocation and, and really capture that illiquidity premium and, it, and it's paid off in their returns. If we move on to the next slide, um, so what we've done uh, here is to effectively look at a very simple uh, portfolio model where we um, combine essentially three three different asset classes, um, two being liquid, the, the ASX 200 total return index and uh, the Osborn composite um, fixed, fixed interest benchmark and then We've, we use our own uh, private debt benchmark, which is a combination of our uh, revolutions, uh, returns since inception, combined with um, historical, before we started, uh, one month BBSW, plus a gross spread of, of 450 basis points, less 50 bips of, of model credit losses, which is consistent with um, the returns that um, the revolution team achieved at, at, previous, at previous roles. So the first point to, to note, we've, we've taken 20 years of, of monthly returns. And if you look at a portfolio comprised entirely of just, um, you know, the growth component, the ASX uh, 200 total, um, re total return index, then you achieve a 20 year compound return of 7.6%. But, you know, with, a, with an extremely you know, high volatility of 13.4%. If we move on to the second portfolio where we bring in um, the, the listed uh, fixed uh, interest uh, Osborne composite exposure, 
uh, what you see is that uh, by bringing in this essentially uncorrelated asset class, we're able to um, to really significantly reduce the the, the volatility from 13.4 percent to almost half at at eight percent. And so what this does is it it, it increases your your sharp ratio, um, your your risk versus return. But unfortunately, you know, you compound compound annual return does does dip quite a bit. Um, the next uh, the next portfolio, if we bring in um, instead of uh, the defensive component being all liquid and Osborne composite, if we do a sort of 50-50 split between private debt and, and the Osborne composite, then you can see because we're adding another on uncorrelated asset class, um, we don't affect the volatility, but we're able to drag up the compound annual return to 7.3% from 6.7% and increase the sharp ratio to 0.91, which you know, for a small, uh, small shift in the portfolio, really helps to to um, you know to boost boost your returns, and you know you're really capturing that illiquidity premium, and essentially you know the lack of correlation between um, you know the the Osborne private debt and ASX is, is helping to improve your portfolio returns. If we go to the to the furthest extreme, and we don't include any any listed bonds at all, and we go to a portfolio of just ASX and private debt, then you know we achieve you know an, a, a significantly impressive result of 7.9% compound annual return. So even higher than the the original um, you know, compound returns from the ASX 100, but with with that same volatility for the other two um, you know more diversified portfolios. And the sharp ratio comes in at 0.98. So you would say that you know. In practice, uh, what we're seeing is, is is what sort of you know Host Plus have been able to achieve that by reducing um, reducing the reliance on on listed uh, listed investments, we've been able to to increase compound annual returns, and this is significant. And and other investors like the you know the future fund have significantly you know very high exposure to to unlisted and alternative asset classes. So hopefully this gives you a bit of an idea that you know we're not advocating that you remove all of your fixed interest uh, bond exposure, but you know, depending on your needs and circumstances and your ability to, to lock up your money for a slightly longer term, you can really um, you know, get benefits from, from blending in um, more private debt into your, into your um, portfolio. I'll hand back to Bob now. Great. So um, just a word on performance. Um, and you can see there, you know, the most recent performance for, for the master fund which, um, uh, as Fallon mentioned, the wholesale fee to vehicle uh, invest predominantly in the master fund unit. So this closely mirrors uh, or, or slightly slightly less performance for the wholesale, but it's a good proxy. Uh, yield to maturity is 7.21% as at June 30. That's now, as we mentioned previously, uh, has already moved up to 7.6. Pretty stable credit spread uh, around 570, 580. We have 43 loans. Um, Credit duration is fairly short at one and a half years. Average credit rating is just below investment grade. Very disciplined approach. Uh, and, the, and the committed capital, the fund as at June 30 was 1.45 billion. Uh, performance uh, is all in the form of cash. So this is income that we collect from interest payments every month and every quarter. And we distribute that to our clients on a quarterly basis. So this performance does not include mark-to-market uh, -market gains or losses. Um, we, we, we really have a, a long-term hold to maturity approach on valuations that is independently reviewed every month for, for private debt fund number two uh, by Lindenhall, um, who sign off on whether the, all the assets on a private side informational basis are performing or not. Um, and in that way, we, we're fairly confident that um, this performance will, will continue into the future. Um, the other thing we would also highlight before we sort of sign off is the kind of environment that we're going into going forward is one where we model those on a fundamentals basis for every single transaction that we do. So in every one of our deals that go, um, go up for the full scale due diligence that we perform, which is quite detailed, we are running downside scenarios on what can go wrong. So very different to what private equity would do or what equities analysts would do when they look at long only portfolios and trying to find winners where they're looking for companies to do certain things to increase their earnings. We are looking at things on taking all of those raw inputs and saying, well, what could go wrong? What happens in a recession environment? What happens if interest rates go up? 
what happens if input costs pressures uh, for all of the uh, raw inputs go up uh, or if the cost of funding goes up for an ABS pool? What is the ability for that, for that particular counterparty and sponsor to pass on those input cost changes uh, to be able to maintain their margins and thereby uh, continue to service the loan with a level of comfort? Uh, and that's kind of what our DNA is all about at Revolution Asset Management. It's all about capital preservation. And in all cases, we, uh, that's, that's what you guys have, uh, are appointing us to do through the cycle. So over the next 12 months, um, you know, we, we look forward to having you know, the portfolio tested um, through this cycle. So we just move to the final summing, summing up slide. So we, we do feel as though today we are able to demonstrate that this is a, a private debt portfolio has got very good characteristics in this type of environment. It's a great hedge against inflation. It's got low correlation, it's got regular income. Uh, and as Simon mentioned, is worthy of, of um, consideration and inclusion in your asset allocation plan. Um, you know, where, whereas, you know, having everything in listed markets, uh, which is traditional, uh, doesn't give you the same sort of outcomes and benefit. Um, it's a floating rate asset class, and we've showed you very clearly on charts how that changes through time as rates, you know, underlying rates increase. Uh, we really do like recession-proof businesses, non-cyclical industries, industries and sectors that can weather the storm, uh, be that geopolitical risk, be that inflation risk. Um, ABS portfolios are, are really getting the benefit of the fact that banks are moving out of certain areas. The best example is auto loans, uh, where we're seeing rapid growth in our in our books of, of auto loan receivables to leading non-bank providers in that space. So we look, uh, look forward to being more influential in that market. And really, when we think about the landscape of scale players in, in the areas that we operate on, which is Australia and New Zealand private debt, uh, there aren't too many scale players in the market. In fact, some of the, other, some of the players that were more active of, of sort of we observe are not as active in the current market. So we see, you know, significant opportunities in the market. We, we've showed you, you know, what those look like in the current environment. Um, we've got the assistance of base rates increasing, credit margins increasing, better terms, um, and we look forward to, um, you know, trading uh, very successfully through this period with the benefit of the fact that we have patient capital. So I might um, open it up for questions at this point. Yeah, great. Uh, well, thank, thanks, Bob and Simon. Uh, we've had some good questions come through. Um, uh, one short one was the average loan duration that was actually up on the slide earlier one and a half years credit duration if I can answer that one for you Bob thank you uh, <laughs> you're paying attention that's good. <laughs> so uh, we had a question about the, the difference between fund one and fund two how do you allocate new loans between each fund uh, so that's uh, that's an easy one fund one was a closed ended vehicle that was fully invested through the course of 2019 uh, and so there's only really a small instances before June 30th of this year where if a loan was repaid, we could reinvest it into a new loan um, and to keep that, that fund fully invested. So as of today, now that's moved into uh, its, its uh, harvesting sort of phase where we're giving capital back as loans mature, uh, we are allocating assets um, predominantly to fund two. And there were some separate accounts that we manage as well, which we've got a pretty clear articulated strategy on allocations across fund number two and those separate accounts. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, this is uh, to do with private ABS. Are you seeing any potential issues with worsening LVRs as interest rates go up uh, or covenants getting breached? Um, at this stage, I'd say covenants are, are pretty pretty comfortable. I think, um, yeah, I think your yeah, LVRs are, are an issue, but uh, I would say <clears throat> Moody's just came out with a report. Essentially, the non-bank market has reduced uh, LVRs over the last um, the last three years, and um, particularly the sort of the higher LVRs have been um, much less a part of their portfolio than previously. And <clears throat> at Revolution, in particular, we've focused very much on uh, lower LVRs. And we really don't like to do to do much above eighty five percent LVR. So we consider that we've got pretty significant buffers versus um, versus our peers and and the uh, originators we choose not to back. Uh, I had a question that kind of follows on from that. Um, 
you talked a little bit about uh, the improving terms uh, in the LBO market. Is there something similar happening in the ABS market also? Um, yeah, slightly. Probably not to as much a degree because the ABS market was always pretty strong on terms and, and triggers, which are the equivalent of covenants uh, in ABS deals. Um, so, But we have seen, um, I guess, lending... Um, Lending criteria improve even more from a, from a very strong starting point, but um, we probably didn't have the the erosion of terms quite as much as the, the LBO market, and yeah, so it probably hasn't been as volatile. Okay, uh, there was one specifically on an inflation risk. Can you talk about um, the fundamentals and ability of the assets to understand? <laughs> An inflationary environment, so rather than just as uh, relating to rates. Yeah, so I think the the way that we would characterise it is, if you're backing a number one, number two market share type company that's been you know in occupying that 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 position for a long period of time, it's got significant barriers to entry, and its ability to maintain its margins are a lot stronger than if you got a smaller player. Uh, the one the one example I like to call out is Arnott's. Arnott's is a 150-year-old company. It was formerly owned by Campbell's out of the US, probably non-core to their business and the overall scheme of things. KKI purchased that business um, with um, you know, a significant amount of uh, ability to take expenses out and, and really become more efficient at, uh, at operations. But in this type of environment, think about their ability to negotiate input cost increases. So be they raw materials like flour and sugar, be that energy costs, uh, be that labour costs. So all of those things are facing every business um, that, that is operating in that space. However, the ability for those input cost increases to translate into the final end price of the product, when they negotiate with Coles and Woolies, they're in a far better position to maintain their, their uh, margin than uh, people who are smaller or smaller companies that can just go away. So this is a strategically important offering for all of the major grocery chains in Australia to have Arnott's products because they are so you know, part of the, 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 uh, the fabric of, of Australia. And therefore, we feel pretty good about that. Another great example is uh, MYAB. Uh, may not be the sexiest equity uh, going around in the space, but has been that 30-year, a number one market share uh, in accounting software. The ability for them to pass on increases in their subscription rates if they need to pay their staff more uh, or if they've got other you know, input cost increases, far easier for them to pass that on than if you're a, a smaller, non-scaled, non-profitable operator. Okay, great. Uh, just uh, one or two more to try and get through if we have the time. Can you talk about your ESG integration, uh, any negative exclusions that you have? and a little bit more detail on some of your key holdings, I guess, relating to ESG. Yeah, so I think in ESG, we mentioned that we have, it's ingrained in our investment process. We, um, we have the, uh, the ones that everybody normally has, which is exclusions for tobacco and armaments, but we've gone one step further and excluded thermal coal as a negative screen also. Uh, and that's really because we, we saw a few deals in that um, you know, thermal coal space which on the face of it looked extremely attractive. But we really started to worry about not just the uh, ability for that company to service the loan, but really the refinancing risk at the end of a three or five year kind of loan term. Who would be the natural buyer of, of or refinancing party in, when the world is shifting so quickly into renewables and, and, and potentially having a stranded asset in a fairly, a much shorter period than everybody had thought. So, we are extremely selective. You saw that, that um, deal approval rate being around about 25%. So we turned down a hell of a lot of deals. We really don't want to be in a position where we need to take that risk uh, or be able to have um, you know, a, a situation where an existing client or a prospective client marks us down for having thermal coal exposure. So if we turn that one deal away, then it was a simple matter for us as a small firm to agree that we're probably, if we're not going to do that deal, we're not going to do any in the future. And then to put that as an exclusion as well. Um, we are very conscious in the ABS side to uh, not you know, engage in assisting anyone for predatory lending. Uh, we, don't, we don't really want to be involved in any of that. We have a fundamental aversion to property construction risk 
but also from an ESG point of view, you see these terrible tales of, of um, unknowing buyers of newer apartment buildings that are left with major structural defects. And, and this is a real issue when it comes to governance that, you know, some of these unscrupulous property developers have built these buildings in lightning quick time with, with um, you know, poor construction techniques with self-certification. Um, so you could call that, you know, just being risk averse, but also we had an issue with governance at that sort of second, third tier builder level. So, you know, there's some examples there. I mean, you know, we got, we got you know, positive things that we, we're very comfortable with, like, um, you know, being in healthcare, which really does, you know, benefit from an ESG point of view. Um, you know, these, these are sorts of names that we like a lot. Yeah, great. Uh, we probably have time for one more. That was to do with uh, the LBOs. Uh, you spoke about attractive primary markets in the LBO. Uh, are you seeing uh, anything in secondary markets or is there anything worth talking about? Yeah, we, we, we possibly see maybe not the same level of activity in M&A, although there's a, an article today in the Financial Review talking about, you know, the, there's more depressed valuations in the public market side through the equity markets uh, resetting and potentially private equity is, is potentially more attracted to current valuations than they have been in the past. Uh, and that might lead to more M&A. But in the interim, we're able to go out and purchase secondary market opportunities where we're not necessarily looking for any distress debt, but we're looking for people who need liquidity uh, and they need to sell because they're more for sellers rather than there's a fundamental issue with the credit. So in a lot of these cases where you know, we've, 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 we've um, invested in Australian dollar loans um, and they've also got a concurrent... US dollar tranche. Uh, examples again here are Arnott's and YAB, where we can actually, we've been following the name, they're seasoned deals, so that we've owned them for at least a year or two. We can actually buy them in the US market, which is more, more um, liquid, at what we would see as being extremely attractive levels versus even the primary. So we're able to tilt that, um, that, that um, the ability for us to do that because we've got patient capital, but then have the wherewithal to buy a US dollar tranche and then fully swap it back to an Aussie floating rate basis, where some of our, many of our peers uh, aren't, aren't prepared to do that or can't or don't have the, uh, the necessary skills to do that. Yeah, interesting. Uh, okay, we've maybe got time for one more. I'll give you one minute to answer it. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, to do the LBO examples um, that we gave. Just wondering why the lending terms are improving so much if there's still a lot of uh, cash in the system after uh, so much central bank stimulation. Well, I think I think the point of that slide was there's a lot less cash in the system now than there was six to eight weeks ago. Now, there, that's that's simply supply and demand. Um, there were very active markets. I mean, if you think about the, the, the global landscape of leveraged loans, the US market, um, which is the most liquid deep market in the world, um, not last week, the week before, they literally printed one deal in the whole week. Uh, that is quite extraordinary. We haven't seen that sort of uh, curtailed activity since the global financial crisis. So in that way, we feel as though there isn't the same amount of appetite and volume for deals. And therefore, the ability for, and also the, the ability for us to influence terms is a lot greater today. When we first started the firm some four and a half years ago, we could only do 10 to $15 million per deal. Our most recent deal, because of the size of our business now, we can do $100 million buy and hold. And that gives you a lot more ability to negotiate key terms and conditions, but also negotiate better upfront fees, uh, in this case, in these two examples, doubling, and then a, a significant increase in, in the credit margins at a time where base rates are rising as well. So it's, uh, it's all that, that pendulum has swung firmly from being uh, in the favour of private equity firms and the borrowers to you know, the lenders, and that, that's a natural, you know, cycle that, that moves, you know, up backwards and forwards. That's great. Okay, well, well thank you, Bob and Simon, uh, for the presentation. Uh, it was really interesting uh, topics today and hopefully beneficial for everybody else uh, who, who dialed in. Um, thanks to all existing investors. Uh, we very much appreciate your ongoing support. Um, welcome any feedback or further questions you have outside of this forum. Uh, if you have any questions, that's uh, everybody from Channel Capital on the team. So please get in contact with the right person uh, in, in your region. Uh, we're more than happy to run through any questions or, or anybody that's dialing in for the first time listening to 
um, Bob and Simon talk about revolution, we can follow up with any any questions that, that you have. So um, thanks again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks for your time.